swastika, a name that needs no introduction. But the way it is perceived, it definitely does need an introduction. In the West, a swastika is a symbol of hate, racism and horrors of the Holocaust. If you have any interest about the world's history, you definitely know what I'm talking about. And in a diametrically opposite manner, in the East, it is perceived as a symbol of peace, prosperity and well-being. And this is the untold history of swastika. Let's get started. In this documentary, let's break it down into three parts. The first one is the heritage of swastika, how well it is popular across cultures around the world. And the second one is how swastika is abused by the Nazis. And the third one is the most important reason why I'm making this documentary film, the Vedic heritage of swastika, its actual roots. Let's get to these topics. And that's the first chapter, the heritage of swastika across the world. A picture speaks thousand words and so do the symbols. Right from the beginning of time, since humans came into existence, the symbols in the cave paintings are one of the earliest known articulations of human thoughts. And with the evolution of the civilizations, a progression has been made by carving those symbols onto the walls of the temples or the tombs. And with further evolution and as well in parallel, the script got evolved where humans can articulate their thoughts in form of alphabets or symbols. And if we go deep down, say the Hindi letter K or the English alphabet K or an Urdu alphabet B or a number one plus sign or even swastika. Technically all are symbols representing a meaning and a purpose. Even our alphabets are also symbols. Just that we have raised to that level of consciousness where we identify an alphabet with a sound, calling it as an alphabet and not really as a symbol. Let's try in doing this. Say for instance, I assume that you don't know Chinese, just like me. Take any random Chinese alphabet. It is just impossible for us to identify that it is an alphabet. We don't know whether it is an alphabet or a number or a symbol. So deep down, everything are just symbols. Once we get educated about it, then we start understanding and identifying them as numericals or alphabets or just symbols and swastika is one such symbol with a clear-cut intent meaning and purpose and let's try to understand what it is eventually in this documentary a very interesting thing with swastika is it is one of the oldest symbols which has been continuously in existence since thousands of years. Take a look at the pottery here, which is from Greece. 760 BC, 400 BC, 800 BC. So that's almost like 3000 years from now. And if you observe the way these symbols are hand painted thousands of years ago, at least one thing we can say it for sure that the symbol took the center stage in the aesthetics of that particular pottery. It is not just an ancillary decoration. The painting of swastika on these pottery is clearly intentional and the maker really want to have this in the center, taking the center stage. Swastika is also found on the coins of the ancient civilizations like Minoan civilization which is older than the Greek civilization and the Greece itself we have certain coins with swastika dating as far as 550 BC. And swastika is also found on the ornaments in the ancient civilizations that thrived in the Eurasia. And these what you're seeing on the screen are one of the oldest ornaments from Italy to Scandinavia at least 2000 to 2500 years ago, currently under display in different museums, having swastika as part of their aesthetics. And like this, swastika has been found in many places across Europe, Asia and Africa and some traces in the Americas as well, dating back to a couple of thousands of years. And one point what I'd like to make here is swastika is a reasonably complex symbol and it cannot just happen by intuition. So for instance, if you're talking about a square or a triangle or a circle, these are very basic symbols. Swastika, as you see, it's not that simple or you cannot just attribute everything to intuition or just coincidence. It cannot be a coincidence. There is definitely a common cultural fabric that has been shared by these ancestral civilizations. Just that we did not decode that yet, how the swastika traveled across these cultures over thousands of years. And many of these cultures do not exist today. And it's very difficult to understand what is the cultural connect with swastika across the civilizations, which are lost in time. But when we get to the East, things are totally different. 
Swastika is very much alive in the dharmic world in the traditions like Sanatana Dharma or Bauddha Dharma or Jaina Dharma. In these practices, Swastika is very much an active symbol of peace, prosperity and well-being and is highly revered with different connotations in all these three dharmic traditions. And Sanatana Dharma especially being the oldest religion in the world, if Sanatana Dharma is revering swastika for a good reason, there must be definitely a very deep history connected with it. But what's most important thing here is, these three traditions, Sanatana Dharma, Bauddha Dharma and Jaina Dharma, put together, they form 21% of the global population belong to these three Dharmic traditions, which include Sikhism as well. But they do not worship swastika directly, but they do revere it as one of the holy symbols, as it belongs to the dharmic tradition. So we are talking about 21% of the global population revere highly it as one of the auspicious symbols. Yet, in the West, swastika is a symbol of hate and racism. And let us try and understand how the symbol of peace got transpired into a symbol of hate. And that brings us to the second chapter the abuse of swastika by the Nazis. And I want to talk as little as possible about the horrendous Nazi ideology. And just for the benefit of people who do not know about it, you have definitely heard the word Hitler or Adolf Hitler. He is a barbaric dictator in Germany and his ideology was like there are certain races of people who are pure and certain races of people who are impure and they kind of persecuted the Jews in millions which is often called as the Holocaust and is nothing less of what the British did to the India. The swastika was used, I'm sorry, abused by the Nazis as their emblem. Now I just want to focus on one very important data point regarding this abuse and that is the reason I'm bringing this up. Let's see what it is. To get to the root cause of the abuse of swastika by the Nazis, we have to go back to India to early 1800s. Those were the days when the India is under the colonial occupation of the British. And we have Sir William Jones, who's posted in Calcutta as a judge. And William Jones is also a linguist and has immense interest in understanding the oriental languages, including Sanskrit. And in the year 1821, he published his discourses or his research on different Indian languages, especially on Sanskrit. And his research holds an incredible place in the world history of last 200 years. This research of William Jones has transpired many things across India as well as across Europe. Now let's see what is it about. And here is a page from the discourses of William Jones and I'm quoting it. The Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is a wonderful structure, more perfect than Greek, more copious than Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, both Greek and Latin. So basically what he's saying is, the Sanskrit language is more perfect and beautiful than Greek and Latin, two main languages which are the foundational pillars of the Western civilization. And here is the most important thing. What he says is that no linguist could examine all these three, Sanskrit, Latin and Greek, without believing them to have sprung from some common source, which perhaps no longer exists. So basically what William Jones here is hypothesizing about is that Sanskrit, Greek and Latin, all three of them have one common ancestral language which do not exist today. It is a hypothesis that he puts forward and this hypothesis was eventually taken by people with vested interests and they brought in a cooked up theory called as Aryan Invasion Theory. Now I'll not get into AIT what it is. If you're not aware of it, please do your reading. Now, like I said, people with vested interests who are more racist in nature and India is already been under the occupation of Europeans back then. So they kind of cooked up a theory called as Aryan Invasion Theory, which says that India was not just colonized now, but it was already colonized thousands of years ago by their ancestors who were Aryans. It tries to establish that certain sects of Europeans belong to this Aryan clan. And this theory is abused by the Nazis to cook up a theory of Aryan race and you know the whole story. This hypothesis made by William Jones and the presence of swastikas across the world in the ancient civilizations led to this horrendous Nazi supremacy ideology which eventually led to millions of deaths and the world war and the rest is history. And that's how the swastika is abused by the Nazis without knowing a thing about what it is or where it came from. 
and that brings us to the third chapter understanding the vedic history of swastika and where it all started let us try in decoding this mysterious symbol this is not any standard but this is just my analysis any symbol that you take has three very important components let's see what they are let us say i want to invent a symbol to convey an idea the very first thing is the intent of the symbol and in our context why is that many ancestral civilizations use swastika what has been their motto now that is the very first facet what we need to understand about swastika and moving on to the next the construct of the symbol and here in our context why is swastika written the way we know today and why is it eerily similar across the cultures around the world why is that swastika written the way as we know today that is the most important question and then moving on to the third one and why is the symbol named as swastika in first place are there any other names to it in other cultures across the world now these are the three very important questions that we need to understand let me give a simple example and things will be a lot more clear say for instance take mango the fruit i want to write it down now the very first thing is my intention to write the word mango now moving on to the second part the construct of the symbol which is here i want to write the spelling of a mango so i have to write m a n g and o all these alphabets in a sequence that's how i'm constructing this word and the third one is calling it with a name now how do i pronounce mango the phonetics the way i am pronouncing mango giving it a name and calling it back saying that this is a mango now my intention of thinking about a mango and wanting to write the spelling of a mango plus the construct of the word mango plus giving it a name or pronouncing it as mango all three are in one line and all three have to match i cannot think of mango and write the spelling of an orange and call it as an apple right it's that simple same way what is the intention of swastika why is it constructed that way and why is it called as swastika in first place all these three should perfectly match not just for swastika but for any alphabet or any symbol across the world now again i say this is not any standard this is the way i looked at things and this is my analysis now let's try to understand the intent of swastika the construct of swastika and the name of swastika as to why is it called swastika and let us start with the easiest one the name of swastika what does it convey now this is very well known to many of us swastika is a sandhi of two words in sanskritam su and asti su means auspicious and asti is happen or may it happen so the word swastika means may the auspicious happen it's a kind of a blessing now let us try to understand how swastika was called in the greek civilization which is the cradle of the western civilization as we know today what did the greeks call it as they call it as tetragrammaton and the meaning of tetragrammaton is tetra as in four and gamaion means the one that's made with four gammas gamma here refers to the third greek alphabet gamma alpha beta gamma so you see here the gamma how it looks like and an inverted l so basically what the greek version of swastika it is called as the tetragrammaton means a shape which has four gammas that's what it means tetragrammaton now moving on to the infamous nazis who abused swastika what did they call us they did not call it as swastika but they call it as hakenkreuz which means hooked cross a cross as a plus and which has hooks in the edges so that's what hakenkreuz means a hooked cross now if you see these two words tetragrammaton and hakenkreuz both explain the physical properties of the symbol right the way we see and perceive they are explaining the physical properties of the symbol while the sanskritam word swastika explains the ideological property of the symbol swastika does not explain anything about how physically the symbol is constructed rather we chose to express the intention behind the symbol so one thing which is very very clear without any doubt is the intention and the construct the three things what we saw just now two of these things the intention and the construct are in line with swastika but absolutely there is no intention being conveyed behind tetragrammaton and hakenkreuz they are just explaining the physical properties of the symbol that's all and the reason why i just took these two as the greek civilization as we know it's the basis for the current western civilization of this modern world and that's the reason i picked up greece and the nazis of course they are the ones who made it infamous so that's the reason i just picked up these two guys but you can do your analysis in which all languages it is called differently and try to find out whether it is reflecting the ideological 
position of swastika or the symbol or just explaining it physically this is point number one and let's move on now that we understood the meaning of the name of swastika let's get to the intent of swastika do not lose out on the three topics what we discussed the name the intent and the construct these three should be always in line and we just finished off with the name and now we are into the most important topic the intention behind swastika so getting straight to the point rug vedam and yajur vedam these are the two ancient scriptures especially the rug veda which is the oldest known ancient scripture in the whole world in these two vedas there is something called as swasti vachanam and what you're seeing here is an ancient manuscript of yajur vedam which clearly reflects this word swasti vachanam and the meaning swasti vachanam means words of blessings or good words in that sense now clearly from the vedas the word swasti vachanam exists and it has a very noble purpose now let us try and understand what it is now swasti vachanam or swasti mantra or is also called as swasti sukta a couple of names to it so basically swasti mantram there are sets of vedic hymns that pray to para brahma indra vayu and many other vedic gods for universal peace and prosperity of all living things on this earth one very interesting thing with sanatana dharma is here people pray for universal peace and it doesn't say that it prays only for the people who believe in it hope you can understand what i mean that is the reason we say sarve jana sukhino bhavantu and not sarve hindu sukhino bhavantu anyway so let's get back to swasti mantra now what you're seeing towards the right is around 7 to 8 verses from the rigveda which is nothing but the swasti mantra itself and this is one of those eight verses and here is how it reads swasti na indro vruda sravah swasti na pusha visva veda swasti na staksharyo arishta nemih swasti no bruhaspatir dadatu and the translation is may god indra of great fame bless us may the omniscient pusha bless us may the protector garuda bless us and may lord bruhaspati protect us now these are the prayer hymns in which the word swasti is repeated four times like i said the word swasti means showering the blessings of the gods a prosperity well being in that connotation it is used now this reference from the rigveda is the oldest known reference of the word swasti which is the root word for the swastika symbol as we are using today and like this the whole swasti mantram continues praying to the vedic gods seeking their blessings for prosperity and peace and well being in life and in these seven verses the very first one it says that let the noble thoughts come to us from all the four sides read the sentence it's a literal translation of the first word anubhadra kratavo and so on so let the noble thoughts come to us from all four sides and the translation continues but the important point what we need to observe is the very first line of swasti mantram which says that let the noble thoughts come to us from all four sides or directions is very much reminiscent of the articulation of swastika symbol with four legs it could possibly be the same reason and then the whole swasti mantram continues after that now that we understood the name why is it called a swastika as to what is the intention behind the articulation of swastika now comes the third and the last thing why the swastika is constructed the way it is now this is going to be a bit open ended as we are going to analyze the facts as it is swastika is very often attributed to sri mahalakshmi so there must definitely be certain relation between sri mahalakshmi and swastika now let's try to understand the word lakshmi and the sanskrit meaning of lakshmi is lakshyate iti lakshmihi basically what it means is when we have a goal or a lakshya in life progressing towards that lakshya is our topmost priority for each and every one of us and the mother goddess who takes care of us in the journey towards our lakshya is the mother goddess sri mahalakshmi in fact the hindi word lakshya or the word lakshmi both in one it's the same so swastika could be reminiscent of the prosperity in the journey towards the lakshya however there are no scriptural references that i came across at least till now which confirm this hypothesis 
of attribution of Sri Mahalakshmi to the swastika symbol. Nonetheless, since many years, this has been the practice as part of Hinduism. And if one really want to understand how swastika is attributed to Sri Mahalakshmi, then we also need to understand there is something called as Yantra Shastra and Sri Vidya, where Sri Mahalakshmi is often consecrated in the form of a Sri Chakram or a Sri Yantra or Mahalakshmi Yantra. So there are a lot of two dimensional geometric diagrams in which the divine feminine is consecrated. What you're seeing on the screen is a very ancient manuscript which shows a yantra that is drawn with hand. It is part of the Sri Vidya. Like this, one should be able to get to the bottom of Sri Vidya somewhere to understand where exactly this swastika symbol is coming in from. When I'm saying coming in from, I'm referring to the geometrical articulation of swastika. So with the very best available sources what we have, two very important things. Lakshate iti Lakshmihi. So representing a target, that is one part of it. And the second one is Swasti Vachanam, which says that let the noble thoughts come to us from all four directions. With these two references and the third one being the ancient tradition of drawing swastika in temples and in the places of worship, everything points down to the fact that swastika is very much reminiscent of Sri Mahalakshmi. Now wrapping it up all, the first one is name of the swastika. It comes from the Sanskritam word swastika which means may the auspicious happen. And the second one is the intent of swastika articulated in Rigvedam and Yajurvedam as part of the swasti vajanam, which means the words of blessings. And the third one is construct of swastika a theological articulation of Lakshyate iti Lakshmihi representing a target or a Lakshya, a swastika and is reminiscent of Sri Mahalakshmi. Now the name, intent and the construct all three perfectly adds up and this is the reason why swastika represents prosperity, well-being and happiness as part of human lives. And this is the reason behind the Indian tradition of having swastikas in our homes, in the temples and the places of worship where we knowingly or unknowingly representing the mother goddess Sri Mahalakshmi. And the question as to how swastika became a shared cultural fabric right from India up until Ireland in Europe. How come this divine symbol of swastika which is very native to Bharat traveled across Eurasia? That is a question that doesn't have an answer till now. But whatever it is in whichever civilization that we are referring to these three aspects should be perfectly aligned otherwise it just doesn't make any sense and this alignment at least till now we can find only in bharat and this is the untold history of swastika and as always thanks for watching